Chapter 5 Nick was still sleeping when Finch grabbed a handful of his shirt and pulled him to his feet. His legs wobbled for a moment as he snapped out of his slumber. "'Morning, boy,' said Finch. Nick's dark hair was a tangled mess. Finch spat on the palm of his hand and smoothed it down. "'Now that you've slept on it a bit, tell me, are you glad you joined this band of mine?' Nick looked around, wiping grains out of his sleepy eyes. Most of the gang was awake already, and some were staring at him. He remembered the warning from the night before and looked at their faces, but couldn't guess which one had come to him in the night. It took a while to decide that the incident had really happened, and he had not only dreamed it. Suddenly, he realized that Finch was waiting for an answer. He knew there was only one safe reply. Yes, I'm glad, he half mumbled. Happy to hear it, said Finch. But I wonder if you have the grit to be a thief like the rest of us. Nick straightened out of his slouch. Hadn't he proved himself by climbing the tree? I'm a thief already, you know. Truly now? And what have you stolen? Food, mostly. Other stuff, too, Nick shrugged. He wished he hadn't left his sack of trinkets behind when he was chased from the farm. Finch smirched at him. Finch smirked at him. You'll be stealing more than food from me, Nick. Are you thief enough to get away with it? I am. We'll see. The entire band hid on opposite sides of the forest road. Finch didn't hear the approaching wheels yet, but his sharp ears caught the whispered conversation between Squint and Pute. What kind of nutty robbery is this? muttered Pute. Why don't we just drop a tree across the forest road and put an arrow in the driver's back when he stops? Finch knows we can do it that way, Squint said knowingly. But that's not the point. The point is to test the kid's character and make sure he hasn't got any. Pute snorted. <laughs> When's a wagon coming anyway? Should be any moment now. I spotted them at Jack's Fortress, leading the chest onto it first thing this morning. Finch had heard enough. Quiet over there. One day soon that nettlesome pute was going to wear out his welcome. Finch was thinking about ways to end the cook's employment when he heard the sound he was waiting for. Nick was a hundred yards down the road closer to the approaching wagon. Holding a long coiled rope that was tied to a large iron hook, he crouched behind a tree that grew by the roadside. The other end was knotted securely to a knobby root of the tree. He could hear the wagon drawing near, but would not be able to see it until it rounded a bend in the road, just ahead of where he hid. His nerves were jangling as he went over Finch's instructions in his mind. The volume of clattering hooves jumped as the wagon draw drew near the bend. Nick poked his head out and risked a quick look. The horse came around first a handsome brown beast pulling the wagon briskly behind along. Before the driver came into view, Nick pressed himself against the side of the tree. Finch had instructed him well. As the wagon rolled by, Nick kept his back to the tree and circled around, always out of the driver's sight. Then, with the hook in hand, he ran after the wagon, staying as low and quiet as he could. The rope uncoiled as he ran. Nick kept his eyes on the driver's back, afraid the man would turn and see him. But the driver was unsuspecting, whistling as he rode through the cool, sun-speckled forest. Nick was fast and nimble, and he soon caught up. This was the most dangerous moment, mounting the back of the wagon without alerting the driver. If you just jump right on, he might feel your weight jostle the wagon, Finch had told him. Finch seemed to be an authority on all things nefarious. So wait until the wagon runs over a bump or hits a rut and then climb aboard. That way he'll never notice. Sure enough, one of the wheels hit a stone. As the wagon bounced, Nick grabbed one side and hauled himself aboard. He looked up, certain the driver would turn around and catch him, but the man just chuckled at the rough ride and resumed his merry whistling. The wagon had walls on both sides but no gate in the back to make it easier to slide cargo in and out. The chest was right in front of Nick, a wide wooden rectangle with metal and leather hinges. Nick had to hurry now. At any moment, the rope would pay out completely. 
Creeping forward on hands and knees, just a few feet from the driver, he put the hook over the near handle of the chest. Then he retreated, glad to be beyond the man's reach. He swung his legs over the back of the wagon, slid off, and ran to hide behind a thick shrub. As he turned to watch the results, Nick was surprised to find himself exhilarated by what he'd just done. The rope snapped taut, forming a long straight line between the root of the tree and the back of the wagon. It twanged like the string of an instrument. As the horse trotted on, the chest slid off the wagon bed and fell with a heavy crash. The driver whipped his head around. When he saw the chest lying in the road behind him, his mouth dropped open in a dumbfounded expression. Nick had to clap a hand over his mouth to stifle a giggle. The driver tried to shout something, but could only sputter. Then he pulled back on the horse's reins and the wagon came to a stop. He stood on the bench and looked back at the trunk. It dawned on him too late that someone was up to no good. His head swiveled like a storm-blown weather vane as he saw 12 dangerous-looking men burst from hiding and charge from every direction. As Nick watched the savage attack, he suddenly found the situation not funny at all. The driver fumbled for the reins to spur his horse on, but two men seized the horse's bridle. Toothless John leaped on the cart and drove a hammering fist into the driver's jaw. The poor fellow dropped head first to the ground. The gang surrounded him, each one bearing a club, a knife, or an axe. The driver struggled to his knees, holding his head and grimacing with pain. Then he looked at the merciless bunch around him and his face went pale. He tried to talk, but his voice trembled as he pleaded for mercy. Look, boys, I won't give you any fight. Take it. You can have the chest, the horse, and the cart, too. Just let me go, won't you? Please. Finch laughed first, and the rest of the gang echoed him. They drew their circle tighter like a noose. The driver put his hands together, either begging or praying. Nick stepped from his hiding place and ran closer to see what would happen. Finch stepped forward and grabbed the sobbing driver by the hair. He raised the jagged knife with his other hand. No! screamed Nick. Finch froze, then turned his head slowly around. He held the blade high and glared at Nick for a long, long moment. Then he tucked the jagged knife into its sheath. Don't worry, lad. We're just teasing him a little, that's all. Finch pulled the driver to his feet by the hair and gave him a shove toward the wagon. Go ahead, my friend, on your way. We will keep the chest, as you were so kind to offer. The driver gaped at Frank Finch, his breath hitching. He turned to go, but the gang still surrounded him in an unbroken circle. Let him go, Finch growled. Toothless stepped aside at once. With an exaggerated mocking bow, he gestured for the driver to pass. The man took a hesitant step, then ran for the wagon. Toothless John stuck his foot out and tripped the driver as he ran past. The man stumbled into the side of the wagon. With a whimper, he climbed onto the bench, snapped the reins, and urged the horse on. Some of the gang looked puzzled. Some looked angry. Pute stared after the wagon, shaking his head. Finch ignored them and gave Nick that mask of a smile. Nicely done, Nick. Why don't you go open that chest and see what we've got? While the boy ran to the chest, the gang turned to Finch. What was that all about? hissed Pute. Since when are you so merciful? Shut up, you maggot, shot back Finch, talking low so Nick would not hear. Are you blind? Did you see the look on that boy's face? He's got no stomach for blood. He might have run off on us, and that would have spoiled everything. Listen, all of you, this was just a test to make sure he'll do as we say. We need him for one more job, and that's that. You can do whatever you want with him after he gets us into Jack's house. Toothless John looked pleased at the thought. Aren't you forgetting something, Finch? asked Squint. That little smirk was back on his face. Finch whirled around angrily. What? The advantage of surprise. Lost it, haven't we? What are you talking about? Well, what do you suppose will happen when that wagon gets back to old man Jack's place 
and the driver tells Jack what a lovely time we showed him in the forest. Don't you suppose they'll be a touch more concerned about defending the fortress with a band like ours lurking about? As Squint's words sunk in, Finch closed his eyes, bared his teeth, and pounded his palm with his fist. He felt like he might explode. Squint took a step back, perhaps thinking he'd tweaked his volatile leader too much. Then, just as suddenly, Finch calmed himself. He let out a deep breath, opened his eyes, and began to speak softly. The gang passed quick glances to each other. They always found his icy composure more unnerving than his rage. No, we haven't lost anything. We simply have to move our plans up a bit. That fellow was heading away from Jack's house. He won't be back till tomorrow if he has the courage to come back at all, and will attack tonight. Finch had waited too long for this opportunity. He would not be denied. Hey, the boy yelled from down the road. The chest is locked. It won't open. The band strutted over. Finch squatted beside the chest and inspected the lock for a moment, twirling his arrowhead beard. He pulled a slender pick from his pocket. A fool could pop this lock. Squint, I'll have this open before you can finish. Tom's gone. Squint cleared his throat and recited, <clears throat> Tom's in the farmyard to steal himself an egg. Along comes the farmer and cuts off his leg. Tom's gone a-hunting on the king's royal land. Along comes the sheriff and cuts off his hand. Tom's gone a-napping in the queen's royal bed. Along comes her highness and got it, said Finch. The lock clicked open and Finch swung the lid up. He looked inside, and then he put his boot against the chest and kicked it over in disgust. Ugh, nothing but books! Books spilled onto the dirty road. It was a heap of worthless junk to the gang, too heavy to haul on their journeys, and besides, there wasn't a scholar among them. But the boy seemed enthralled. He picked up the most colorful book from the pile. You know how to read, boy? Just some letters. I never got as far as words. The boy flipped through the pages with an unpracticed hand. Inside on every page there was a single large letter, a drawing, and a word underneath. A with a picture of an axe, B with a picture of a bee. He turned several pages together. There with the letter G was the picture of a giant. You like that book, Mick? It's yours. For a job neatly done, said Finch. The rest will kindle our fires. Let's get back to camp. Two of them tossed the books back into the chest and picked it up, sharing the load. The band went back into the forest, heading for the lair, and Nick followed with the book tucked under his arm. Finch walked nearby, observing. He'd come close to losing the boy, but Nick seemed more at ease now, even a little proud of his performance and pleased with his reward. Finch was sure the boy could be trusted with one more task, the only one that mattered. All Nick had to do was climb the vines and open the door to Jack's house. The less he knew about that beanstalk nonsense, the better. Finch didn't want crazy ideas getting into the boy's head. And as for what would happen after the door was open, the boy must know nothing of that at all. Finch pictured the small group of people who lived in Jack's house, the servants, the little girl, the old legend himself. Reaching to his side, he gave his jagged knife a gentle squeeze. He looked forward to meeting Jack and his friends very soon indeed.